Yusuf, how long is your talk? I'll keep it. I'll try to keep it short. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen, okay. eighteen minutes. Is that okay? That's fine. Fifteen. <laughs> okay. No. no. Uh, it was question actually. <laughs> okay. I think India Pakistan match starts in one hour, so let us just keep it short today. <laughs> Sandeep, you, you know what the score is going to be, so what's the point? Are you in betting? Uh, listen, every time I bet, uh, you guys get hammered, so let's not bet today. Mm -hmm. Sandeep is quiet. Yeah, I think it's it's always a good match. Um, yeah, it should be fun. Yeah, I, I think uh, all these World Cup matches are fun. So hopefully it, it'll be fun. Duty, are you okay now? Or are you still with your cell phone? I'm still with my cell phone. Imad is trying to send me a direct connect, um, connection. Something he's trying. No problem. I will continue in this. I can... Salman, can you or Nikolai run the uh, quiz? Um, no problem. I think we'll get Nikolai to run the quiz since um, or Sandeep can run the quiz. Okay. Then we uh, announce Sandeep or Nikolai. Which? Uh, Nikolai is not here yet, so you can announce Sandeep. Okay. Since he's already here. And for the third talk, uh, for the second talk, probably Dr. Judy will uh, moderate. Uh, and for the third one, your, your talk actually. Uh, should we talk to the third one? But I cannot see. He, he, he hasn't checked in. So, um, Imad, can you please check if he's um, checking in? Can you just check with Ignatius? Yes, sir, Dr. Nicola has joined. Uh, I'm checking with Dr. Ignatius. Okay. Okay, if uh, he will be here, he can moderate for the third uh, talk. And uh, otherwise... Hi, guys. Hi. So it's, it's unpredictable with me because I'm on call and I'm uh, with a junior registrar, so... Maybe somebody else uh, is going to be unpredictable. Nicola, we don't feel sorry for you. It's okay. I might be possible. I might. Okay, but I'm with very junior registrar that I was just operating chronic uh, acute subdural hematoma. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah, brush, brush some skills. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have one minute, but uh, Nicola, your connection is not perfect. Uh, yeah, I'm in the hospital. I'm I'm just on the move because I'm on call. Sorry, say. Okay. <laughs> That's all yours. Okay. Uh, um, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Said Naderi from Turkey. Uh, I would like uh, to start uh, third uh, session meeting of the se season meeting of World Spinal Kind of Society. Uh, how I do it? The topic of the uh, today's meeting uh, is cervicothoracic junction surgery. We have three uh, important uh, speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Yusuf Sheikh. Uh, he will talk on cervicothoracic junction anatomy. Can everybody see the presentation? Yeah, not, not yet. yet. <laughs> not yet. We are waiting. Yusuf, can you reshare again, please? Disconnect and reshare. Okay, I'll try resharing. Is it okay now? Yes. 
it's okay okay so today we'll be talking about cervico thoracic junction anatomy now we have already extensively discussed cervical spine anatomy before and also thoracic spine anatomy before so this is largely going to be a brush up of all the information that we have had before and uh, because it's cervical thoracic spine so we'll be largely concentrating on the subaxial uh, cervical spine as well as the upper thoracic spine and various forms of instrumentation and the anatomical landmarks that are clinically important so uh, in terms of subaxial cervical spine we know that it extends from c3 down to the level of uh, c7 and the uh, vertebras are stacked on one top of the other having an intervertebral disc space as well as associated facet joints which are formed by the lateral uh, masses so if we look at the axial section of uh, cervical vertebra we can see that it has a cylindrical shaped body a uh, transverse process having a neural for, uh, having a foramen for the passage of vertebral artery the lateral masses with superior and inferior articular facets above and below a big canal for the passage of the spinal cord as well as the lamina and the spinous process now as we can appreciate that this the only important anatomical structure or the large bony area that you can appreciate is this lateral mass and this body so these are the two areas which you generally access in order to achieve any form of instrumentation through an anterior approach your plates and screws will go into the body and through a posterior approach this is the lateral mass that you tend to employ in your fixation through lateral mass fusion now this on the right side is a c7 vertebra this is a transition between the cervical and the dorsal spine and this is where you tend to decide between the lateral mass fusion and then you when you go distally you need to combine it with medical screws so if we look at the subaxial cervical spine in coronal session we can appreciate that between the two intervening uh, vertebra is the intervertebral disc and what we have laterally is the uncovertebral joint now unlike any other form of joint this is not a true joint it's a false joint and this represents an uncovertebral joint now this contributes to formation of the medial wall of the neural foramen so it is important that you decompress this joint whenever you are doing an anterior approach so if we look at this diagram we can see that this is the typical cervical vertebrae and generally what you tend to do is put in a screw to employ the lateral mass in lateral mass screw fixation but this represents the pedicle and if you want to achieve you can also do a pedicle screw in this but because the margin of error is so low because medially you are bounded by the canal laterally you are bounded by the vertebral artery so this is a very narrow window of error plus the trajectory is quite medial it is roughly 40 45 degrees so you need to have a good exposure to have a 45 degree angulation so i'm not saying that pedicle screws are not possible in uh, subaxial cervical spine but it's just not worth the risk because if you have igs if you have neuro navigation you can do it you can still do it but it's just not worth the risk and sometimes the pedicle are very small so you need to use the smallest screws possible in terms of diameter so then we have the lateral masses which we have the superior and inferior articular facets which contribute to the formation of facet joints so as you go from above to downwards you can see the orientation of the facet joint changes from being flat to being more oblique which allows for flexion extension movements and this is just a diagrammatic presentation that how does a lateral mass group look like so we have intervening disc space which is largely made up of proteoglycan substances and hydrated proteins they contribute roughly about 20 15 to 20% of the entire height of the uh, what is spinal column then we have the ligaments the important ones are the anterior longitudinal ligament and posterior longitudinal ligament the anterior longitudinal ligament is a relatively flat band where the posterior longitudinal ligament is a relatively thinner band its calcification can lead to various forms of anterior osteophyte formation or posterior opll formation then we have adjacent supporting ligaments which include the ligamentum flavum 
the intertransverse ligament, the supraspinous ligament. The ligamentum flavum is an important entity because it is also referred to as the yellow ligament because of its yellow color. And sometimes because of its significant hypertrophy, it may be the only factor that may contribute to severe spinal stenosis. Again, this is a sagittal MRI. We can appreciate that the blue line indicates anterior longitudinal ligament. This is the posterior longitudinal ligament. Here we have ligamentum flavum and then the supraspinous ligament. The content of the spinal canal, we know that it is the spinal cord having an edge shaped gray matter and surrounding ascending and descending white matter tracks. I'll be not going into the details because most of it we have covered previously. So we'll be uh, skipping through the important elements and we'll be emphasizing more on the bony and apical landmarks. So if we talk about the cervical spinal nerves, we know that the cervical spinal nerve is made up of anterior and a posterior root. The anterior is the ventral root, which is the motor, and the posterior is the dorsal root, which is largely sensory. So if we talk about the boundaries of the neural foramen, then we need to be sure then as I mentioned previously, that this is the axial section, this is the cervical spinal nerve, and this is the medial wall, which is formed by the ungovertible joint. So as you can see in an anterior approach, this nerve has to be decompressed in order to relieve the pressure of the medial wall. Laterally lies the vertebral artery. Superior and inferior are bounded by the pedicles and posterior laterally we have the facet joints. So in a setting of facet joint hypertrophy, this can cause significant posterior compression. So these are the boundaries of the neural foramen. Then we have the blood supply of the spinal cord, which is from the single anterior spinal artery and two paired posterior spinal arteries having a centripetal and centrifugal system. Similarly, then we have the vertebral artery, which has four subdivisions depending upon its course. The C7 transverse process does not transmit the vertebral artery, but this is not always the case. In approximately three to 6% of cases, the transverse process of C7 may transmit the vertebral artery. And then we have the various segments of vertebral artery. It is important that how and where does the vertebral artery turn over the C1 vertebra so that you are aware of it. The venous drainage system is more or less the same. And it is important that whenever you are instrumenting the cervical spine from the posterior element, the positioning of the patient is important. The head end should be slightly elevated because as you can appreciate, there is a very extensive venous network in the cervical spine as well as the upper dorsal spine. So if the patient's head is down, there'll be extensive venous pools pooling and it will make procedure very difficult. So positioning of the patient, adequate venous drainage is important to combat the venous drainage system. So if you talk about the surgically relevant levels in terms of uh, subaxial spine, we know that the angle of mandible contributes to C2, hyoid bone is C4, thyroid cartilage is C5, and cricoid is C6. Now, generally, this is to be remembered, but because all cases that are being done require confirmation twice by two different surgeons with the help of fluoroscope, so it is unlikely that you are likely to make a mistake. So it is important that you remember these, but always, always confirm the level twice with the fluoroscope interoperatively. So, and then the approach to a uh, subaxial cervical spine can be anterior or anterior lateral. Anterior lateral is largely lateral to the carotid sheath to uh, encounter lesions which are on the lateral aspect or around the vertebral artery. Whereas the standard anterior approach is generally medial to the vertebral artery, oh, sorry, carotid artery, so that you do a standard anterior disectomy or an anterior approach. This is the plane that we generally use for an anterior approach to the subaxial cervical spine that you displace the carotid sheath laterally. The trachea esophagus is directed medially. And because this is a natural plane, you generally do not encompass any bleeding or significant vessels. Occasionally, you may come across one or two superficial veins that you can ligate. Now, this is not just for the cervical spine. In patients with long neck, you can access even D1 and D2 through a neck approach, through a standard NDA cervical approach. Generally, what you can do is uh, pull down the shoulders, put, pull on, put on neck traction, and generally you will be able to access even D1 and occasionally D2 
through a standard anterior approach. You need to be careful that whenever you go down, that is D1 and D2 in the anterior approach, then you cannot go much lateral as the apices of the lung should not be damaged. But if the patient has a long neck, then a routine anterior approach to C7, D1 and D2 should also be possible without doing a sternotomy. So if we talk about the muscles in this region, these include largely sternocleidomastoid and the longus capita. The, uh, then we have the uh, longus coli muscles that we generally uh, come across. So in this video, we have seen this before that uh, this is the skin. Underneath the skin, we have the running platysma muscle. Then we have the sternocleidomastoid. Then we have the longus coli muscles. And once we remove the longus coli muscles, underneath we have the running uh, sympathetic chain. This is the C7 vertebra. This is the D1 vertebra. And this is the anterior longitudinal ligament running anterior, going down from cervical to dorsal spine. If you talk about the various viscera and nerves, this is important for both perspectives, cervical as well as the upper dorsal spine. Reason being that when you are, when you are doing an anterior cervical approach, generally surgeons tend to do it from the right side. By definition, anatomically, recurrent laryngeal nerve as it hooks around the subclavian artery is more at risk of injury on the right side. But in experienced hand, it is again quite unlikely. Temporary dysfunction or dis temporary dysfunction or hoarseness of voice can occur, but permanent dysfunction is quite rare. If you go down to the cervical thoracic junction, that is D1 and D2, through an anterior approach, then you, you need to be cautious about the veins in these areas. The superficial veins can be taken, as I mentioned before. Even internal jugular, if by mistake you have injured, it can be ligated. But once you go down to D1, D2 level through an anterior approach, the brachiocephalic veins have to be protected under all costs. The deeper veins should not be damaged as it will not only jeopardize your procedure, but will cause significant oozing into your operative field. The apices of the lung come over here. So these are the various viscera that need to be careful when you're going down to the thoracic area. So vascular we have covered, recurrent laryngeal nerves and nerves we have covered. So this is again a diagrammatic presentation of what neural structures are present. This is the middle cervical ganglion at the level of C4, inferior cervical ganglion at the level of C7, and then we have this recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is hooking around, possibly around the subclavian artery. This is the sympathetic trunk, and this is the superior cervical ganglion. So if we talk about the dorsal spine, we see that the anatomy tends to change. Now the pedicles, the heart-shaped vertebral body, we have good pedicles, lamina, spinous process, and transverse process. And from the lateral aspect, you can appreciate there are two new elements, that is the facets. These are the demi-facets. There's one facet joint at the upper end plate, one facet at the transverse process, and one facet at the inferior end plate. The upper end plate facet and the transverse uh, uh, process uh, facet contributes to articulation with the rib. Now, this will be the rib of the corresponding vertebrae. So if it is a C6 vertebra that we are talking, uh, sorry, if it is a dorsal D6 vertebra we are talking about, then this is the contributing to D6 head and D6 rib tubercle. The lower demifacet articulates with the head of D7 uh, rib. So as we talk about the presence of demifacets on the sides of the body, which articulate with the head of the rib, the spinous process, which are long and quite slant. This is again the same diagram showing the location of demifacets. And this is how a rib articulates. Now in this diagram, as you can appreciate, this is the posterior aspect, this is the anterior aspect. So if you want to achieve some form of instrumentation, then you do either a dorsal pedicle screw or you can utilize the transverse process for the passage of screws. So if there is a lesion directly anterior to the vertebral body over here, then unlike lumbar vertebra, you cannot retract the dura and address the lesion over here. That is not possible because any form of traction in the spinal cord will cause neuropraxia or permanent dysfunction. So either you go through a lateral approach and if you want to reach the center, you can change your trajectory to a lateral approach. Other than that, you can do a transthoracotomy or anterior approaches that will be discussed later 
in the chapter, the thoracotomy and other forms of anterior approach. Over here, we have seen the rib. Underneath the rib runs the vessels, which include the segmental artery, veins, and nerves. The atypical vertebra is D1, which is having a single facet for the rib only, not the second rib. Same goes for D10 and 11, 12, which have single pair of facets for articulating with the rib, not two facets for the rib of the corresponding level and the level below. So if you look at this diagram in a sagittal view, we can appreciate that in a D1, the pedicle is at the upper level of the vertebral body. So your screw orientation is likely going to be from cranial to caudal. In most circumstances, what surgeons do is angulate the screw intentionally so that an angulated screw will give more purchase. As you go down, the pedicles tend to come lower. So instead of an angulated screw, you can do a straight screw. And this is an L1. So as you can appreciate from D1, going from upper dorsal to lower dorsal spine, the location of the pedicles slightly go down. So in the upper pedicle, in the upper dorsal spine, your entry point is at the upper border of the transverse process. In the lower dorsal spine, your entry point is at the middle level of the transverse process. So this is a diagrammatic presentation that how you can maximize the purchase. So this is a traditional pedicle screw, but this diagram shows that how you can utilize the rib head as well for the form of purchase. Because occasionally the uh, pedicle may be very small, maybe five millimeter. So your, you will be limited to use of four millimeter diameter screw. If that is not the case in these circumstances, you can use a bigger screw and then angulate from the lateral aspect. We have two important joints, the costovertebral joint and costotransverse joint. Both of these joints uh, are true synovial joints, but as I mentioned in an anterior lateral approach or in a costotransversectomy, you can remove all this to address the anterior pathology. The ligaments are the same as in the cervical spine, anterior longitudinal, posterior longitudinal, ligamentum flavum and the supraspinous. These are the various muscles that need to be borne in mind, which include the multifidus, semispinalis. Then we have the latus mus dorsi, trapezius. What generally this slide emphasizes is that the importance of minimally invasive. Because if you do a traditional approach and do so much muscle retraction, then it is likely to cause a very significant amount of post-operative pain. So a minimally invasive will avoid so much muscle resection and muscle destruction. The kinetics is that now, uh, this is just a couple of slides that the dorsal spine allows flexion extension movements and the lateral degree of flexion is limited by the amount of ribs. So this was, so this was just a brief description of the anatomy of the cervical and dorsal spine. I had a lot of elements to cover, but uh, in a limited time, this was uh, the maximum that we could get based on which we can build upon our uh, surgical exposure and surgical uh, presentations. It is important that in the dorsal spine, we are aware that they are segmental vessels. In most circumstances, we do a left-sided approach. If you are doing an anterior approach or thoracotomy, then segmental vessels can generally be compromised. Although no such studies have indicated that the segmental vessel uh, ligation causes neurological deficits, but a general consensus is there that do not ligate or do not diathermize more than one or two consecutive levels of segmental arteries, that is the uh, intercoastal arteries, predominantly on the left side, as it may cause some degree of quad ischemia. So this is probably it. I'm sorry I took a little more than 15 minutes. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much uh, for your lecture. Uh, is there any question or contribution? I just want to remind to uh, young uh, surgeons, actually you said uh, in three to 5% of the cases, uh, vertebral artery uh, go to C7 vertebra. Uh, vertebra. This should be uh, known and should not be for, uh, forgotten. Uh, therefore, uh, personal anatomy is important. CT and MRI uh, should be checked for a position of the uh, vertebral artery 
uh, in C6 and C7, I think. Uh, any other question? Okay. Uh, now I, I think Dr. Juti uh, Pratiban, uh, our co-moderator, will introduce uh, the second speaker. Thank you. Is Judith here, Dr. Judith? Judith, mm -hmm. please unmute yeah, yourself. It, 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 okay. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, uh, definitely I have uh, nothing great to, to speak about, Professor, for these ionies. And um, uh, the subject is going to be more interesting because of the anatomical description given by the young uh, postgraduate. Uh, manubrial approach to the CT junction is the most important uh, subject the neurosurgeons are looking forward and to know more about it. And I invite uh, Professor Iranis to uh, start his talk on uh, manubrious anatomy. Professor. Do you see, uh, do you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yusuf already mentioned a lot of things so that is uh, for this region. So you have to remember that when we are talking for cervical thoracic junction, we're talking about this area. And so we have, uh, when we try to address this area, we have some major concerns. First is that the, this, uh, the cervical thoracic junction is deep, and usually this deep uh, increases from cranial to coda. And also we have the sternum, and uh, the sternum sometimes projects uh, different levels. It can vary from C7 to T3. And also, when we are going to approach anteriorly uh, the cervical thoracic junction, we have the main vessels, and uh, we need sometimes to retract them, sometimes to ligature, uh, so we can uh, approach the spine from anteriorly. We have to remember that the thoracic inlet slopes forward and downward, and it has significant variation in size and shape in people, and also it's oblique. So as you can see here in this uh, diagram, uh, we have a projection, we have the manubrium and the first strip uh, on the laterally. So it's the same, it's a kidney bean shaped and the dimensions is five centi centimeters anteriorly and the transfer dimension is 10 centimeters. And we have uh, the borders, posteriorly is the T1, uh, anteriorly is the manubrium and laterally is the first strip. And in this very uh, narrow uh, <laughs> space, we have all these structures. You can see we have the major vessels, the trachea and chofaga. Also, we have the lungs. And uh, so we I remind you a little bit of the muscles because these muscles, we, we need to know them. So we have the sternocleidomastoid uh, uh, muscle and the omoyoid and sternoid muscle. They are important for our for our approach. And we need to know the veins, especially the left brachiocephalic vein that is under uh, the manubrium M and the uh, uh, clavicle and must be protected during our operation. Also, you will have to remember that in this area, we will find the aortic arch that usually starts at T4, T5, reaches T3, T4 space, and ends in T4. And also the other thing with that we need to remember that if we go from left, we will have the thoracic duct. If we go from the, uh, the right, we will have uh, the vagus nerve. So also another important thing is the vagus branches that we have to remember that usually they are sent in the tracheo, tracheoesophagic groove. Uh, higher is on the right and lower in the left side. In the left side, passes around the aortic arch and then the right under the subclavian. Also, sometimes we say how we decide what kind of operation we will do. They, in our spine, there is a, a, practical, uh, a practical sketch how we can see this. If uh, we see in the lateral radiograph the satisfactory CT image, if we're looking through the manubrium notch, 
if we can see the upper thoracic, then a common lower uh, cervical would be enough. But if we can on, only see the lower cervical, then an extended approach is recommended. So when we do the transclavicular transmanubrial approach, we position the patient supine. We slight extend the, uh, we have a slight extension of the neck and of course a rotation to the right. Usually we prefer to go from the left. We, we can combine this, uh, our uh, incision with a lower, lower cervical approach, or we can have uh, this kind of uh, incision like a, the semi tough or we can have also like a tough Greek tough and uh, usually after we go we have to expose the medial head of the clavicle and manubrium and we see the sternal and clavicular heads of sternocleidomastoid and the sternoid and sternohyoid thyroid uh, muscles. Uh, we can either divide the clavicular heads of the sternocleidomastoid or divide the sternoid and sternoid muscles and distract them and retract them. And we do the usual blind dissection to viscarotid plane. Uh, there is also, uh, we can remove the clavicle to the, and uh, with a jiggly saw, and uh, we can take off the manubrium piecemeal and uh, we can disarticulate the clavicle. There. But you have to remember that we have to protect the virtual uh, cephalic vein that is under the clavicle. Uh, also another way is to remove uh, the manubrium in one piece with the, uh, with the stenoclomastoid and retract them. And then we can put it back again after the operation. When we remove uh, the manubrium and we expose the, uh, the vessels, we can retract the vessels caudally. We can retract the carotid laterally and of course the visceral structures medially. And so you have to remember that we prefer to go from the left side. We need to protect the brachiocephalic vein under the clavicle and to identify the recurrent laryngeal nerve so we cannot injure it. And usually we retract the great vessels caudally, the visceral structures medially and the carotid sheath laterally. Uh, the transdermal approach is a quite similar approach. We have the patient uh, supine, supine slight extension of the neck and rotate the head to the right. And uh, we can combine it with the left sided low cervical approach. And it's a quite good approach for down to T4 if we need to go uh, more, uh, more caudally. It's better to try from another way, not in side. And usually, to do the same that uh, we see after we uh, split the sternum, we see the viscerals and we can retract the, uh, the great veins caudally and uh, the carotid laterally and uh, uh, the viscerals immediately. Thank you very much. That's uh, the approach. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it was a uh, very crisp and uh, extremely nice talk. Um, in fact, that uh, uh, the approach, the approach which we always uh, uh, think more important here is because of the lesions at uh, T2 or T1 and T2 uh, in short necks. Um, as uh, the resident was talking about in long necks, there may not be a problem, but in short necks, uh, they do a problem. Uh, so the approach which you enumerated, all the three, four approaches is extremely good. Um, that there is also one more thing which I would like to emphasize is the open door approach, uh, wherein that you do the manipural cut and then come down, then the open up to the, the second rib and then rotate it as a open, open door uh, and then swing it back uh, without excising from the uh, you know, uh, totally. So this actually is very good in post-operative recovery. Uh, that's one point. Another point which I was noticing in this approach for T2 lesions particularly, uh, 
lesion ectomy is much more easier, though it is in the deep. Uh, it is deep in that, but then, and after that reconstruction is a bit difficult because uh, reaching D3 for instrumentation will be tough. As you rightly pointed out, then uh, you may need to do a stenotomy. So, uh, I personally feel that that the preoperative assessment, preoperative radiology, uh, uh, personally about MRI and 3D CT angiographies, uh, will definitely give a good uh, understanding about the anterior approach. Uh, this is a very important point which I like to emphasize to the students because many times, many times, as as you said about the taking of the brachiocephalic vein is very important because it just is there, just below the manubrium it is there and you may have to retract. And most of the simple retractors is enough. But I just wanted to put forward one more thing is that, uh, do you uh, take the assistance of the thoracic surgeons in your unit or, uh, or many neurosurgeons do by themselves? Because we uh, generally we take a systematic effect in our unit to, to be with thoracic uh, surgeons also be with us because we take it as a principle uh, so that you know uh, we are more leisure when we go for the lesionectomy rather than focusing on the exposure. Professor Lawrence. Okay. I usually uh, have a, always a thoracic surgeon with me. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, modern, medical legal uh, because I'm in private sector so for, uh, I have to be uh, always to have someone to back me up because there is the possibility that someone can say if we have a problem that is because we didn't have a thoracic surgeon. And uh, I can tell you, uh, because of the collaboration with the thoracic surgeons, I prefer not to do the, uh, the sternotomy because the thoracic surgeon believe that it's not needed to do a such big uh, splitting of the sternum. And also they prefer, um, prefer to take out the manubrium in one piece with the muscle and put it back again and not uh, piecemeal uh, as we uh, think that we can do. Uh, it's better to, to reconstruct back everything. I agree with that. Like, that's a point I was talking about is uh, the open door technique. Like, you know, you open it, uh, split in the manubrium and then go to the uh, second uh, uh, rib and uh, break it open and then open it completely, it swings on one side with a nice retractor, then you do all the approach and then close it back. Another point of very much important is uh, securing uh, a, an implant, an anterior implant on cervical thoracic junction. Uh, that is most interesting point here because uh, your arch of myota, it comes at T4. We think T4 sometimes is very difficult to angulate and put a screw on an, on an anterior plate. So this is a very a technical point, which I felt is more uh, difficult in anterior approach. So um, uh, to, find, uh, to find an angulated screw uh, in, in, in inserter is very difficult, but I remember uh, some company, somebody is uh, produced that kind of a, a screw inserter with an angulated uh, driver. I do not know, maybe I think some of my colleagues can uh, address this point. Salman? Mm -hmm. Yes, Juti, um, I've seen that screwdriver, but I don't know the company and I haven't used it for a long time. I think there are easier ways of doing things, so that's why we do not do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's always we can have also other... Comments other on this because, um, you can have also the third rib for thoracotomy, uh, also other techniques you can use uh, if you need uh, to put a, a big instrumentation. It's not, because uh, anteriorly it's quite deep and narrow and it's not always feasible to do this. But uh, nearly, uh, nearly all, can I just say something? Nearly all the, nearly all the, the companies now which are having this uh, zero profile screws, they will uh, provide you with the, um, zero profile uh, uh, cages, they will provide you with angled screwdriver. There is angled screwdrivers, there is screwdriver that is basically a spring and you can have variety of angles. So this, this probably will be uh, easier technical issues in case you have that and in case you have to, to uh, screw under angle. Yeah, I think, I think so that it, 
I personally feel that because I felt the need of that angle screwdrivers. Um, uh, it, it is tough to go to that region. And uh, it, it, is, it looks like as if that you are just behind the arch of Avatar. You know, you push it down and then it, you, it is technically it is difficult. And maybe we're not allowed to say companies, but I'll let you I'll let you know later on which companies will have that and you can use okay. it. <laughs> yeah, through personal messages, yes. Um, I think uh, if there is no more question, because uh, I see the chat box, there's not much of question on this. I think we discuss everything on this point. I think we can move on to the uh, with permission from Salman, I think move on to the next uh, next uh, topic here. It's Dr. Salman Sharif, uh, our uh, president, uh, will talk on Torakodomi. Well, um, thank you. And thank you, Judy. And thank you, Seth, for um, running this so smoothly. Um, um, I think I was not supposed to give this talk. This talk was for men for um, Mike, but uh, Mike had to um, uh, do some other work as an emergency. And that's why I uh, slipped in. Um, this is looking at thoracotomy and uh, tips for cervical thoracic junction. Um, since I did not have a prepared talk before this uh, or two days ago, so I asked a couple of my residents to help me and I asked Mehmet for some slides. So it's a mixture of everything. So I thank uh, everybody who's contributed. Well, uh, first thing I'm going to talk about is transaxial thoracotomy for cervical thoracic junction. This used to be a routine procedure uh, when lots of uh, TB spine in this region was dealt and uh, many people would do that. And, you know, um, this had become quite an easy thing to do for orthopedic and uh, neurospinal surgeons. This was way back in 49 that Professor um, Goetz from South Africa uh, described this in 1949. And did, he did some demonstrations in, in England. In 62, Ross introduced and popularized it, and he used it for uh, first rebexation for thoracic outlet uh, syndrome. Well, you need a GA with double lumen, and we know why double lumen, if we need to um, deflate, make things easy for us. Uh, generally, at this level, it is required if it's uh, very tight in that, because it's already very tight in that area. Usually, we use the left side uh, and with a 70 degree elevation. The right upper arm is abducted anteriorly, and the elbow flexed to 90 degrees. The forearm must be in front of the face and we secure all pressure points. So it's something like this. So your arm is way up and you need to secure all the pressure points when you do this. Um, and the incision is five to six centimeter along the posterior border of latissimus dorsi parallel to the long thoracic nerve. Uh, we split the serratus anterior between latissimus dorsi and pect major and we're looking for long thoracic nerve while we are doing this. So if you look at this, the so first, second, and third um, uh, um, rib that we can feel, and then you've got latissimus dorsi intact in front, the clavicle can be seen here, long thoracic nerve would be running just in, uh, behind this at this level. And we can see the long thoracic nerve running down here all the way down. Um, what we have done is we've hi uh, hidden the pect major as well as lead dorsi here, so we can see all the structures underneath. So, you know, it's the same case with uh, arm elevated above. Uh, so once we do that, you know, we go inside and we're looking for, through the serratus uh, anterior into the long thoracic nerve. Once we found that, we use the third rib, uh, which is the principal site for gaining access to the upper dorsal spine. It's usually the uh, D1, D2, D3 you can um, expose from here. Um, we use the, the routine subperiosteal section of intercostal muscle. We uh, protect the inferior neurovascular bundle, just like we need to do all the time. And, you know, we take five to six centimeters of the rib. So it all depends how much of um, um, dissection you need to do, but for a sim single level uh, vertebra, vertebra uh, at D1, D2, C5, six centimeter of rib is okay. So again, the same exposure, looking at the, uh, the third rib at this level, and we've got the long thoracic nerve running down. And uh, once we have gone through uh, taking the rib out, we take away uh, the rest of the structures. And once you retract the uh, pleura and the lung below, then you can see the um, third, uh, first thoracic vertebra quite clearly. The second and third are quite easy to do. First is slightly uh, tricky because you've got vessels and nerves coming in your way. The important thing is to take away when you're doing this, 
Um, you need to take away um, the vessels that come into it, the segmental vessels, the hemiozygous veins over the vertebral body. They need to be ligated in order for you to have enough exposure for debridement and grafting. Obviously, pleura uh, needs to be incised carefully. You use divers or whatever retractors you have. There are malleable retractors that are available, just a routine kind of thoracotomy that we routinely do for um, lower levels. So you've got incision like that, and this is the way we are coming all the way inside and working onto the vertebra. After surgery, we leave a chest tube in place and incision is uh, closed in layers in the standard fashion. Uh, complications, obviously there are issues with that. You know, if you open the serratus anterior muscle, identify the long thoracic nerve, and then you retract it underneath the retractor. Sometimes the um, long thoracic nerve may be lying above instead of underneath the serratus muscle and you can cause problems at that time if you're not prepared. Um, there's increased chance of thoracic duct on the left side and that's why we, do, we always uh, try to use the right side if at all possible. You need to know your anatomy well and if at all possible use the spinal cord monitor when you're working here. Um, the right side should be preferred because the absence of major mediastinal vein or arteries on this side. Um, obviously, if you cause damage to the intercostal brachial nerve, you can cause some dysesthesias. Uh, you need to carefully retract the muscles there when you're doing that. You need a strong person to retract at this time and the retractors need to be proper. Your angulation of 70 degrees helps you looking at the vertebras above. Uh, the absolute uh, prerequisite is that this should be a virgin surgical field. Somebody's gone in before you're trying to do that, you will cause serious problems to the neurovascular structure there. Uh, you need to be prepared for the long thoracic nerve variation. What's going to happen is you're going to have a drop uh, wing scapula and you don't want that. Um, making it susceptible to uh, sharp injuries is possible but once sometimes it's running through the middle of the sclenae muscle. Um, avoid laceration of the pleura. It increases morbidity. Uh, parietal pleura, pleura laceration is not a problem, but visceral pleura and parenchyma needs to be protected underneath the fat pad. So uh, now let me go briefly into another way of doing this if you're doing this from behind. So you look at the T1 and uh, you're gonna be approaching the cervical thoracic junction from this region. And we know we can approach it through costotransectomy. We, can, we know we can go through the pedicle as well. Um, Translaminar screw fixation for T1 is simple, easy. Uh, we have already discussed this in many times in our uh, webinar. So basically the approach is the same. The idea is that whatever you hook up above into the cervical, you hook it up with the laminar screws going perpendicular into the uh, lamina on both sides. And they're very easy to ensure that you're, on, you're okay because you can eyeball the lateral extent of the cortex so you know how far in you're going. And obviously these are long rigid screws that have got excellent uh, biomechanical strength. Uh, and as you can see here, in the bilateral crossing the transdaminal screw, uh, usually it's very, very simple to do um, and in, in this level and very safe as well. <clears throat> then you can have costal transfers screw fixation. Uh, landmarks are shown here. So just the transfer process, edge of the transfer process and uh, the articulation of the rib that can, comes underneath it. And the direction of the screws is obviously uh, laterally uh, 25 degrees. And what you need to do is you need to have cross through the four cortices. And if you do that majority of the time, it is pretty reasonable. In this particular case, you can see some loosening. And you know, if you have it only a single level, then obviously you can, we will cause problem. You'll need to have more than one level for it, for it to have proper strength. Um, the raw diameters here uh, matter. Uh, if some people use tapered uh, rods, and by what, but that I mean the rod above in cervical spine is smaller diameter, and below is a um, uh, is a bigger diameter. And that, so those are available. Dominoes are available, and when you're using this, obviously you can use crossbars as well to ensure that there is not enough movement there. So uh, all these can three different types of um, equipment we can use. This is a study in which in 2007 it was shown that. If you use um, just uh, you know, straight rods, uh, smaller rods, then obviously that's going to, uh, there's a good chance it will break. Tapered rods are, are fine. If you have dominoes, they work very well as well. Um, same thing is shown here that if you use a hook, hook rod, rod construct, it is the weakest. The screw rod construct is the best. If you use a screw connector rod using dominoes, then obviously it's uh, somewhere in between. 
The raw diameter of a construct is not very important according to this study from uh, two years ago. Uh, this, these are a couple of uh, uh, cases that I got from Mehmet. Um, so a 69 year old female neck and back pain after a low fall, uh, Parkinson's, osteoporosis, lung um, and <clears throat> problems, Hodgkin's disease, C6 and T2 osteoporotic factors, drop head, significant muscle atrophy and C7, C8 paresis. So what Juti was talking about, can you approach this, the T1 from here? You can see where the manibrum is. So this is possible to approach anteriorly. Uh, and so this patient, patient was approached anteriorly and posteriorly so to take that out anteriorly, fix that, and then come from behind and fix that patient. The idea is to correct that drop head as well at the same time and correct the alignment um, uh, too. So this, is what, this was the final picture of that patient. Um, what about cervical thoracic kyphosis? Obviously, um, it is possible to correct that because um, the best thing about uh, C7-T1 area, as um, uh, Seth was just pointing out, that if you don't have vertebral artery going there, then it's much easier to do osteotomy in this area. And it, it is very simple to do because you don't have to worry about the vertebra at this level. And this is shown here how it is done. Um, and traction and head uh, extension obviously closes the gap at the osteotomy site once you have done this. Uh, so showing you a case of a drop head on a patient, a, a 40 year old person, and you can see the uh, osteotomy going all the way across. And once you've done that, you reduce it with the help of a head extension um, and then fix at the same time with lateral mass and T1 to pedicle screws or a translaminar screw, whatever you want. So this is pre and post-op in this particular patient. So in conclusions, um, alternative fixation techniques for T1 and T2 are good options. Dwell diameter rods and fixed domino connectors are the strongest options for cervical thoracic junction and fixation. And best osteotomy site for the kyphosis is T1, which is very, very safe. So you've got excellent dorsal exposures for pathology from D1 to D5. Um, obviously, uh, it is familiar anatomy. Uh, some approaches allow adequate anterior exposure. Some pathology clearly better handled from the posterior approach. Nowadays, we are able to handle majority of these problems from behind uh, with the newer and newer gadgets that are available to us. However, you choose your approach according to patient's pathology. Do not let your lack of armentanium determine your approach. So uh, thank you all. And uh, hopefully uh, we're going to meet sometime in Himalayas. Thank you very much. Any question? We have more than 90 uh, parts. Well, I have a question to Salman. I would like sure. to, uh, in the case that you are having the drop, uh, the drop head, are you doing your also the uh, instrumentation first, then go anteriorly, posteriorly first, then anteriorly, and then back again? Yeah. Or it's, you mm. So okay. it's 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 uh, back front back. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a long operation. Um, regarding venebral approach, uh, transvenebral approach, um, I did about four or five of them initially about you know ten eight years ago, and I haven't done one since then. And, but what I found, they complained of pain quite a bit. Um, and um, that really put me off because their original pathology, they weren't complaining of, but they're complaining of this um, approach pain. Uh, is that the case in, in the patients that you are dealing with, Yanis? It's a mixed there. There are uh, patients that they don't, uh, they don't have a, a, lot, a lot of pain. Some of them, it has pain, but many patients don't have pain. Yeah, that, that's the point I was making it, right? You know, they, what I understood, I learned from the thoracic surgeon is that, you know, they do this open door manubrotomy, right? You know, they do not excise it completely. So it is being cut at various places and then you open it up, now finish up the surgery and close it. So the HP, you do not dislocate any joint. Uh, maybe that may be the reason the pain is less. <clears throat> In my patients too, I, 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 I learned this because uh, earlier days, if I remember correct, we used to do the sundaration approach, uh, you know, lateral. Uh, we used to take some part of the, uh, your, your clavicle, clavicular manipulative approach 
uh, initially. Then we became more medial. Then we start producing just man brought to me and then do a small window for smaller approaches. But then if you wanted to open it, then it is better not to dislocate completely, but just to, you know, they, they do that. It is very easy actually. Cut it, they cut two cuts on the, on the mandibrium here or the mandibrium laterally. And then you put the, the distractor, that is, you completely open it. And then you finish it and put it back. It looks very simple and uh, they are reasonably less painful. Yeah. I can tell you that uh, when I, I first started it, I, I was waiting that the patients will be miserable, they will be not tolerated well, uh, but it's not the case. It's, uh, they tolerate quite well. Yeah. Okay, there's a question about, uh, do we use bisphosphonated before and after an osteoporosis patients? Yanis? Um, the question is, do you use bisphosphonates uh, for patients with osteoporosis before and after um, surgery? Uh, usually, when we are going to perform uh, an extensive uh, surgery, we, uh, we have also, uh, we check for the osteoporosis. And usually, after the operation, we use teriparatide that is... Um, much aggressive. I think uh, if you don't have a patient with neoplastic disease, it's the better, be, best. Uh, it's the Fosteo. Uh, I don't know if you use it. It's the best, I think, yeah. for this patient. Yeah, no, so if if patient can wait, we use it. Use it for two to three months pre-op, and then use it post-op as well, at least for six months. That's that's the recommendation. Those are the guidelines now. Usually, uh, we usually, here in Greece, we cannot uh, prescribe it before the operation. Wow. Uh, you usually, before the operation, we use other uh, medication for osteoporosis. And after the operation, especially if we have done uh, osteotomies, then we can prescribe it. And usually, it's for four months. And, uh, but it can be extended to two months, to two years. Yeah, the problem using bisphosphonates is it actually works against uh, those fractures and they won't heal and it will work against our instrumentation and it will not help in healing. So that's why it's recommended to use it before if possible. If not, then uh, post-operative as well. Saeed, your input? Uh, no, no, I agree with Yanis. Uh, Right, uh, Nicolay, are you there? Nicolay has no, uh, probably gone. No, sir, he just left. He, he said I have to go. Okay, no problem. You want to show what we have for um, next next um, webinar? By the way, these webinars are both from uh, World Spinal Column Society as well as uh, WFNS Spine Committee. Um, so uh, Mehmet couldn't make it today since he's on a bus uh, going from Istanbul to Izmir. So next time we have um, <clears throat> uh, this thoracic spine, uh, how I do it, and thoracic spine anatomy, pedicle screws and decompression, and the uh, conventional thoracotomy will be dealt. Um, Nicole and Ruli um, from Indonesia would be moderators. Uh, can you share the multiple choice questions? And um, Seth, can you take the uh, take them or? Yes, I can uh, start with uh, this question. Uh, on surface marking, C two corresponds to what level? Angle of mandible, hyoid bone, cricoid, and thyroid cartilage. Uh, so seventy three percent. Uh, of the participants at uh, uh, angle of mandible. Good. Okay, next. The next is, what is the maximum safe distance uh, you can go beneath the longus coli muscles? Three millimeter, two millimeter, five millimeter, and seven millimeter. Uh, almost 45% uh, said three millimeter. Is it correct? Yusuf, tell us, please. Uh, yes. yes, but I, I would like to remind that uh, this is very important for uh, 
sympathetic, sympathetic chain. Uh, yes. And the sympathetic chain is closer to the midline in C6, C7. And in uh, upper cervical spine, it's uh, much more in the lateral. Uh, okay, uh, then the next question. Yes, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve is more susceptible to injury on right side, left side, bilateral nerve. Uh, yes, the right answer is right side. Also, most of surgeons uh, prefer to do from the right and not to choose the left but uh, the uh, right answer is uh, right. 58% uh, of the participant answered uh, correct. Uh, super demi facet of C, uh, six vertebrae uh, will articulate with uh, fifth rib, sixth rib, seventh rib, fifth and seven, uh, sixth rib. Uh, six. six? Uh, Yusuf Sheikh, what is the uh, correct answer? Six, six, the right one. This is it's, right. it's always, it's always okay. above, so it's six. Right? Uh, okay, the, the, that means uh, only 40% of the participants answer uh, uh, question. Uh, uncle vertebral joint forms which wall of the neural foramen? Medial, Medial. lateral, superior, and inferior. Okay, uh, almost 46% uh, uh, answered question. Okay. So now this is for Yanis. Yeah. Yanis. Yanis. Can you continue? Okay. So what's true about the thoracic inlet? It was kidney pin shaped, AP dimension five centimeters, and transverse dimension 10 centimeters, three portals T1, posteriorly manubrium, anteriorly in first rib laterally, all of the above, none of the above, and correct is all of the above. It's a... What is true about the aortic arts? Starts at T3, T4, reaches T4, T5, and T6. Starts T4, T5, reaches T3, T4, and T4. Starts T6, T7, uh, reaches T4, T5, and T6. All of the above, none of the above. Of course, none of the above, it's not correct. So the second is starts at T4, T5, reaches T3, T4, and T4. It's there. Okay. What is uh, true about the Garen Rangiers? They are sent in a tracheoesophageal group. Right passes around aortic arts. Left passes under the subclavian. All of the above, none of the above. The correct is the ascents in tracheoesophageal group. Okay. And what is true about the transmanubrial pose, uh, approach? Exposure from the left side, exposure from the right side, protect the brachiocephalic vein, identify the current IGR nerve. Uh, a, C, and D, B, C, and D, all of the above, none of the above. And the correct is the exposure from the left side, A, C, D. Okay. Okay, um, can we all have our um, cameras on? We just get a group photograph, please, as always. And everybody can smile, and then we get Juti and Seth to um, wrap up once we're done. Are we done, Mark? Yes, sir, it's done. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, actually.
I can say a few words about this. It's an excellent academic uh, piece for the, the younger generation neurosurgeons and postgraduates. And it's a one, wonderfully conducted uh, webinar, I can say. Uh, all the three talks were extremely good and very sharp and uh, very crisp. And it made it take some uh, take home points here. Very lovely. And uh, I have to thank uh, Salman for doing this for uh, long years, and it is extremely good. And uh, Said and Ioannis are very happy and are very thankful. And nice to meet you all here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Said? Yes, uh, it was a good meeting, uh, as uh, in always. Uh, I would like to invite all the people uh, to next meeting, uh, much more people, because the number of uh, uh, participants who answered the questions was uh, 33. Uh, we need uh, more and more. Uh, well, um, and uh, your name as well, I would like to thank to uh, all organizing team. Thank you guys. So let's wrap it up another uh, time. So another day, hopefully we'll meet soon and uh, hopefully we'll have good match now with India and Pakistan. Thank, Thank you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>